here. So, um, Sigilet, you can start whenever you're ready. Uh, I chose to go back to the beginning, to the first verse, uh, remembering and refreshing all the time the great opportunities we gain in this human life and the motivation to practice all the time, re realizing those uh, opportunities. Having gained this rare ship of freedom and fortune, heal, think, and meditate unwaveringly night and day in order to free ourselves and others from the ocean of cyclic existence. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva. בחיים האלה זכית בסירת ההצלה הנדירה, הגוף האנושי יקר הערך, שיש בכוחו להציל אותנו ואת האחרים מאוקיינוס הקיום המעגלי. יום ולילה להקשיב, להרהר ולמדות, זהו התרגול של ילדי הבודה. <clears throat> that verse relates really well to the verse that we're um, up to. They, they go together like a beautiful little pair. Um, so the verse that we're up to on page six is um, verse 36. So you want to turn there? So verse 36 says, <clears throat> in brief, whatever you are doing, ask yourself, what is the state of my mind? With constant mindfulness and mental alertness, accomplish others good. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So this is the way to take the best use of this precious ship of leisure and opportunity um, is whatever you are doing, ask yourself, what is the state of my mind? And this is this bodhicitta mindfulness that I was talking about the other day to again and again cultivate a bodhicitta mindfulness that's not just asking what is the state of my mind, but with mindfulness and alertness is accomplishing others good. You know, not a passive mindfulness, but an active mindfulness. And the active mindfulness doesn't have to feel like stress. It doesn't have to feel like pressure. It's just a, an agenda, you know? It's just having a motivation or an intention that's very clear to yourself. And it's only natural for you to get distracted and forget it, even though it's the most precious thing in your life. Still, you know, to assume that it's carried with you every second of every day, despite it being your, you know, most precious thing, is an unrealistic expectation. So that's why we have to keep coming back to, what is the state of my mind? Is it imbued with bodhicitta? Or altruism? Or something more than myself in this day? And it, when you're in the most self-cherishing, the most self-centered mood, it will feel like stretching after having not moved for hours and it'll be a little uncomfortable to stretch back into bodhicitta. 
But once you're back there, it's a great relief and it's a great expanse and you're freed back up into this deep, important work that then isn't just about your professional work. You know, it's the work of your life and your lifetimes and life is richer and full of more meaning again. It's just that initially, if you're in a real self-cherishing place, it feels like, no, I have to think of only me, <laughs> only today, or only my family, only us, or only me and mine, whatever that is to you. But as, if you um, consciously dissolve that or consciously expand the sphere of us to encompass everybody, there is great benefit. So bodhicitta mindfulness is, is really the, the constant thread throughout all our life. It's not talking about meditation. You know, it's, of course, in meditation, but this is life, life, all the time, life, life. So we've talked about it a lot, but um, I wonder how do you go with bodhicitta mindfulness in your daily life? Are there days where it's just completely natural? You just keep coming back to it. Um, and it, it's just as natural as breathing. And there are some days that you'll spend a whole day and not even remember the point of your life? Or um, I'm curious, what are, the, what are the conditions that kind of help you stay activated? Or what helps remind you when you've forgotten or when it's slipped or lost some power? I think that in a sense, and there are days where I can really touch it, understand it, we are very lucky because uh, it is our daily practice and our studies, but there are our patients which remembers us, which are a wonderful lighthouse for us of bodhicitta. Yeah. Yeah. The hour after hour, we have this practice. What about when you're on holiday? Or like, what about on the weekends? You know, that, that's, that's what I'm kind of curious about. Because I think you're quite right that like when there's an obvious suffering person in front of you, and that's the whole premise of your whole conversation, it's so easy, of course, Bodhicitta, duh, that's the whole point. But then what about then going to the shops afterwards or going on holiday or, you know, the weekend or, you know, how do we maintain it in a different context? Do we maintain it in a different context? That, those kind of thoughts. Um, but thank goodness you have the work that you do because it's keeping that pattern just so much more continuously than if you lived a different kind of work, even though, of course, it's possible in every kind of work. Your work is particularly suited <laughs> to the cultivation of this. Yeah, Iris? Yeah, for me, actually, change brings it up much stronger. So when you say holiday, but any change actually creates more than my routine. Yeah. And uh, also, I hope it will not um, come to me to help me with that, but as you say, hardship. Whenever I'm in misery, misery I'm, well, like when I, there are bad things, it really like, because then I really need it. And then it's, it, is, it really helps me. So actually it is more in those times than in the routine, which I'm kind of, you know. Interesting, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That makes sense though. Do you have um, kind of tricks or techniques that um, will kind of click you back into it if you've slipped off? You know, I sometimes feel like bodhicitta is like a, um, I don't know, a curve in the road that I'm traveling and the wheel goes into it so happily and naturally, but sometimes it falls out of the, the, the route or the rut that I've made for it. And how do I bump it back into its, you know, little slot when it's fallen out? You know, what are the things I say to myself or, um, you know, is it one of the eight verses? Is it one of the 37 practices? Is it just some coming back to the physicality of my being, which makes me more present, which makes me remember what's important? You know, what is it exactly? And, and it's, it's quite personal, but it's worth reflection. You know, how do I click back in or slide back into the important groove that I've developed in my mind? of bodhicitta, you know, what are the mechanisms that will click me back in, you know, in traffic, in shopping, in conversation, in ordinariness, um, in routine, when it doesn't matter, when no one is watching, you know, these kind of things, how do I keep into that? 
or maybe the other direction is more important, what makes me slip out of it. Yeah, so anyway, it's a personal conversation with yourself, but just to ask what, what are the conditions that help me maintain mindfulness? What are the conditions that I give myself permission to lose mindfulness? Um, when do I give myself more of a powerful life? When do I give myself a weaker life? You know, when do I give myself a meaningful life? When do I make things too ordinary and heavy? You know, why, when, why, when? These kind of questions for ourselves, you know, whether it's a journal project or it's a looking out the window project or it's a conversation with a Dharma friend project, it's really important to keep coming back to because intellectually we completely know the way that we want to live. But, you know, in terms of how we actually live, we have to keep coming back to how is it integrating. So um, I don't know, a very helpful technique, of course, is mantras. Mantras help. Um, you know, the, the technical definition of a mantra is something that protects the mind. Um, but, you know, it has to be one that you like and you have some relationship to. But um, it has that impact of keeping you in your bodhicitta or clicking you back into it if you've left it. Um, in a powerful way because you're not just relying on your own mind, you're relying on the minds of the beings that created that mantra and the dependent arising of that being a powerful condition. You know, it's, it's also why we, especially Tibetan Buddhists, have holy images everywhere um, because it's, again, to be like, you know, this is the point of my life. It's not just a pretty picture to inspire me. It's actually a powerful condition for my mind because of the minds of the beings who created the image. You know, so, so powerful conditions, um, we might as well use them. You know, life is hard enough. So we might as well use the powerful conditions to keep us as much in our practice as we can. Um, there's a funny American um, slogan or saying, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. <laughs> right? If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Um, and, you know, sometimes they use it in sports and sometimes they use it in this or the, that context. But the main emphasis is it's much easier to just stay on track than it is to like let everything go and then pick it all up again and get yourself back together again and start again is much harder. It's much harder than if you just stay with some continuity. So um, I thought to just go over a couple of the things from the um, poll quiz exercise from Monday, just because uh, there were some points that weren't as clear to everybody. And that's completely fine. Um, this, the main point of the exercise really is to see what's clear and what isn't. So um, when we're looking at the three levels of dependency, um, dependent on causes and conditions, dependent on parts, dependent on basis of designation. These three levels of dependency, we shouldn't see them as unrelated to each other or um, existing for some things and not others. It's, it's just levels of looking at dependent origination. And this Anzo key was sent to you yesterday. But um, if you just take a minute and think about probably the one that most people got stuck on was number two of the three levels of dependency, which is the only one related to impermanent phenomena only. And that would be dependent on causes and conditions. So what that means is that permanent things, things that are static, things that are unchanging in a momentary way, they're not produced and they don't cease in the same way that impermanent things do. There's, there's a way in which they are quote produced and quote cease, but not in the same way as impermanent things. And yet they're still completely dependent upon parts and they're still completely dependent upon basis of designation. So the coarsest level, the level of causation from the Prasangika view, you know, results are dependent upon causes and causes are dependent upon results, both directions. And this is the main thing to understand is that with anything that is bothering us, triggering us, is making us over-identified, if we can keep the mind flexible enough to go back and forth two directions, what is, what is the dependent ori origination of the cause to the result? What is the dependent origination of the result to the cause? How are the parts dependent on the whole? 
And how is the whole dependent on the parts? How is the basis of designation related to the mind that imputes onto it? How is the mind that imputes onto it related to the basis? You know, so, so this is the like analytical system to get so familiar with that it's almost like, I don't know, um, it's as straightforward as breathing or as reading or as anything like that. So these three levels of dependency, whether you use technical frameworks for them or not, they're, they could be or should be your go-to meditation on dependent arising. And when you hear dependent arising, it should point you to the side of, of relative truth, but dependent arising and relative truth aren't perfectly synonymous, are they? It's as if they are, we talk about them as if they are, but relative truth is by nature deceptive, isn't it? Anything that's a conventionality is deceptive. The deception being things appear inherently existent and the opposite is true. So looking at levels of dependent arising, you're exploring the relative, but you're exploring the relative in order to access the ultimate. Does that make sense? So you're exploring because things rely upon causes and conditions, parts, basis of designation, minds imputation. Because of that, that is why they are empty. So it's my access route to emptiness. So it's exploring the relative in a way that is more logical, more clear, more accurate, but relative truths in and of themselves are deceptive. That's their nature. Is that, is that kind of set of three got some clarity coming to it or do you have any questions? So then we had, uh, what is the self and what is not the self? Number four and number five. Um, and you guys did really well on these and I was, um, I was happy that those two points were pretty clear, but that the self is that which exists nominally, merely labeled on the valid basis, which should say to us, anytime that there's a feeling of more than that or an owner of that, that's problematic and, the, and is part of the whole deceptive nature of our existence. And that's the point of practice. So if you're asking yourself, how do I meditate on emptiness or when or how, you know, these kind of friction points of, I know that the self is only that which exists nominally, merely labeled on the valid basis. And yet I'm thinking that this part of the valid basis is self, is me, is owner, is owned. That isn't true, so let's explore that. Yeah, that isn't true. I know it's not true, so let's explore that. So you can then look at for the object of negation, the inherently existent self, whether it's the inherently existent self or it's um, inherently existent any aspect that the self is labeled on, you know, do what seems useful in the moment of conflict. Um, so any questions about four and five? And then we got into the Heart Sutra, um, six and seven. So in the Heart Sutra, which line is indicating explicitly and directly how to practice the profound perfection of wisdom. And a lot of you um, figured that out, but it is really important to repeat that this section of correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature. Part of the reason it's so important to understand this line is that the rest of the sutra says there is no this, no that, no this, no that, no this, no that. And it doesn't say no inherently existent this or that. And so it's easy to then slide into thinking suddenly we're getting nihilistic and we're negating everything, not just inherent existence. So this line is saying, take this as the framework and then apply it to everything else, the rest of the sutra. So even though I say no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, what I mean is no inherently existent, this, that, or the other. Yeah, so this is, is really an important line to get clear on. Um, yeah, anything about that that you wanted to unpack? 
Yes, Yontan. And yeah. why is that? Why is that so? Why the sutra avoids repeating the same line again and again? Why, why this, uh, the end of the sentence, is, uh, the sentence is omitted and not repeated? Yeah, it's, it, I'm sure it's in the commentary somewhere, but my, my immediate impression is that for brevity's sake, to make it short and sweet and accessible, um, and I'm guessing that it's also because our tendency is so much to grasp onto inherent existence that to say, know this, know that, know this, know that, we're probably not going to go into a nihilistic extreme. We're probably more likely to go into extremes of eternalism, over-identification, etc. So when you hear no, it's very confronting. But if you remember no inherently, then you, you're saved. So, you know, um, in your mind, finish out the sentence, flush out the sentence in your mind. And all of the commentaries say, make sure you hear all of the no's are referencing no inherently existent. But why it's not repeated in every single section, I'm guessing it's just for the sake of flow and for the sake of um, really interrupting the habit that we have to do a double check. Yeah, I'd have to double check to be certain about why. But um, yes, what was drilled into me again and again every time this commentary came up, every time we did this at the nunnery, was this is the key line. This is the really important key line. Of course, we always jump to form is empty, emptiness is form, because it's kind of poetic and intriguing, but actually correctly and repeatedly beholding those five ag aggregates also as empty of inherent nature is, is one of the most important lines. Yeah, that gets drilled into us. Because it's how to practice, isn't it? This is how to practice. Do it again and again, do it correctly, and see it in this way. Yeah, it's the instruction for practice. Um, and then in the Heart Sutra, which line refers directly and specifically to the Four Noble Truths? I think you all got this one. Um, no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. Nicely done. And then the last two were um, which one is indicating ultimate truth and which one is indicating relative truth. So ultimate truth is indicated by form as empty. A relative truth is indicated by emptiness as form. So that section clear as it's going to be for now, I'm guessing. Uh, can you just explain again the conventional truth again, like how emptiness as form is doing that? Yeah, I mean, if it helps, you can think because things are empty, form can arise. Yeah, so when you see emptiness as form, think because things are empty, form can arise. So can feeling, so can discrimination, so can, so can. It allow, it's, this, it's the quote, space from within, things are allowed to arise and move within. If they were empty in a completely unrelated to relative truth way, if they were empty in a nihilistic way, in a nothing, nothing, nothing way, then it would be done and dusted and nothing could change or arise from anything else. So, so hear it as because of possibility, form is one possibility that happens. If that helps? Uh, yeah, but it helps too, but, but, but you say you can hear it as, you can also hear it as what? The, well, okay, you can hear it as, okay, because of the emptiness form can be created in different forms, but, uh, but what other way can I hear it as? I mean, if an analogy helps, then use the analogy of space, right? Because there is space, things can move. If there was no space, I couldn't move my hand. So space allows for the possibility of movement is a good analogy to emptiness allows for the arising of this or that or this or that. So here it is, you know, potentiality, possibility, a place to arise within. If you want to look at it from a maybe a tantric analogy, we, we always equate emptiness with female and womb, you know, you know, womb is space, but it's still a space of a potential, you know, the child can be born from within it. So it, like that. Yeah, yeah I don't know. It, it's hard, that one. It is. It's hard. And so, so we have to sit with it again and again. But um, all of your form is empty. Emptiness is form. 
pith sections from various commentaries are all in your course material. And rather than me reading the whole thing to you, I think it's much better if you guys can just read it really slowly to yourself and, you know, do some writing and just really sit with it. Because um, these things do go a little bit beyond words. So, uh, does emptiness arise from emptiness? Um, emptiness is a quality of emptiness. Emptiness is empty. But emptiness always needs a referent, right? Emptiness always needs a referent. I mean, the, the, the tricky thing is, is that sometimes it sounds like I'm saying a million different things when I'm actually just saying the same thing a million different ways. And hopefully one of those ways will strike a chord and make sense, you know, depending on our predispositions, depending on our learning styles, etc. You know, so, so don't feel overwhelmed. Like this is a huge amount of content. It's the same content. It's just a million ways to talk about it. Um, and at the end of the day, sitting with just one line and just being with one line quietly in a reflective mood, you're going to come to some really important connections and conclusions. It's just, you know, we have to give ourselves enough mental fuel before it will drop into any kind of resonance connection and experience. So the mental fuel we give ourselves are these conversations and the merit created through studying. And it just, it's going to take some time. Yeah. But, you know, you understand enough already for it to have some power in your life, even just understanding dependent arising on the very coarsest, very simplest level of things are interdependent is incredibly profound. Um, but if we leave it as that's the whole story, we're missing out on degrees of depth and degrees of release from suffering and release from afflictive behaviors. But even just things are interdependent it does help you be a better person and a happier person. So, um, so you're already getting good work done, even at the level that we understand at this point. Um, Yael, did you have something? Yeah. I think you already explained it, but still I'm not sure that I'm, I'm totally understand it. So I'm asking again, uh, I'm sorry. No, no. Then, uh, could you please say something more about the permanent uh, phenomena and the fact that they are still uh, empty or still dependent because I'm not sure they have parts right because if they did have parts they would change and they then they would not be permanent right well this depends on what kind of parts we're talking about so you know think about like okay there's the permanent space within a cup Right, so an empty cup has space inside of it, and the space inside the cup is not changing moment to moment, but the cup is changing moment to moment. And if I break the cup, the space is gone. That space within cup concept is gone because cup holding that is gone. But if you were to so you, you know, look inside the empty cup and there's space within the empty cup, you could still say there's the left side of the space within the cup and the right side of the space within the cup and front and back and top and bottom. So there's still directional parts of permanent things. Um, permanent things always rely upon a basis of designation. You know, so they're, they're not um, just the, the mere fact that they're that they're not momentarily changing, it doesn't mean that they're infinite or um, it doesn't mean that they're eternal, right? So lots of permanent things finish. Um, you know, the most important permanent thing for us is the emptiness of the mind, but the mind is impermanent, but the emptiness of the mind is permanent. Hmm. hmm. Interesting, right? But the fact that the mind is empty of inherent existence is its naturally abiding Buddha nature. So the fact that that is unchanging is the good news that means our potentiality is never ruined, you know? So it's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy point. It's not an easy point, even though the general concept of impermanent and permanent is quite easy. But the it's still not clear to me uh, altogether because if, if the space of the empty cup 
is in, impermanent because when there's no cup, there's no space of the cup, right? But so while the space exists, it's not changing. Yeah, during its lifetime as space in cup, space in cup is not changing moment to moment at all. Okay, so that ma- that what makes it permanent? permanent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so when it you can you depend on it, the existence of the cup. Hmm? It's still dependent on the existence of the cup. Sure. Yeah, sure. Also, and the same is the emptiness of our mind. It depends, depends on mind. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so when you hear permanent, don't think eternal, although some permanent things are in a way eternal, in a way. Um, in a way, you know, read the fine print. But, you know, most, most permanent things that we talk about have a lifespan, but it does, they're just not changing within their lifespan. So if you, you, you don't consider the existence and non-existent of them as, as a change, like the, um, fact that the space of the cup ceased to exist, you don't see it as change, right? Well, you look at the change of the cups more than you look at the change of the space. Okay. You know, so it is, it, of course, yeah, in one sense, it is a type of change, but it's a coarse type of change. It's not the subtle impermanence that impermanent things have as one of their qualities and characteristics. Yeah. So while it lives, it is unchanging. That's a permanent thing. While it lives, it is unchanging. Yeah, it lives, you know lives, just for lack of a better word. Yeah, Simona? I'm asking maybe something very, that we, we, had, we had to be understood since a long time, but is emptiness of the mind and Buddha nature a kind of same thing, a kind of, uh, can we say that emptiness of the mind is Buddha nature? We can say that the emptiness of the mind is one aspect of the Buddha nature, for sure. Yeah, one aspect. Remember that Buddha nature has two aspects, the, that which is naturally present and that which needs to be developed. So the part that is naturally present is related to the permanent aspect, is related to the emptiness of the mind. So the naturally abiding purity is the emptiness of the mind, or the naturally abiding Buddha nature is the emptiness of the mind for sure. But then there's the aspect that needs to be developed and that's related to the impermanence of the mind. If we're just sitting with, I guess, when you're, when you're thinking of Buddha nature, um, you know, and we're doing Buddha nature with cohort two right now. So if you're wanting to do any reviews, you can look at their playlist um, <laughs> or I can send you that chart again. But remember that um, when we break things into basis, path and result, they're related to relative truth, ultimate truth, method, wisdom, practice, and then the two Buddha bodies, which can be then further subdivided into four. So the results of practicing related to the relative and the results of practicing related to the ultimate are the body of form and the body of truth or the body of forms and the bodies of wisdom. Yeah, those are the two Buddha bodies. So, um, yes, 
Anyway, <laughs> one part of Buddha potential is permanent. Yeah, you know, just kind of some of us are more visual, some of us are more auditory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you're sitting with this, you know, make a framework in your brain that makes everything live in a tidy place. And once it's clear enough, living in a tidy place in your brain, in your mind, then you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And that's why that one line is so important, correctly and, re and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Starting with the correct part is in incredibly powerful. Just trying to get things correct in your mind and to place them in the right way, it's, it's a hugely profound step. And so that process itself gives energy to the next steps. It's like, oh, I've got it. Okay, I've got to repeat the fact that I've got it. Because I'm guessing that because we've talked about emptiness so much, there's been times that you guys have kind of been like, oh, I get it, I get it. Oh, it's gone. Yeah, you know that feeling of like, yep, I think I'm there. I think, I think I'm understanding what's being said finally. And then it just like slips through your fingers. And that's why we have to keep coming back to it again and again. Yeah, and you know, when you have a little aha moment, you know, write it down, record it on your phone, do something, don't lose it, you know, because then you can repeat it and keep it. Um, and then you don't have those kind of like insights that just pass or, oh yeah, that was a good day. Anyway, I don't really remember what we talked about though. Yeah. So, so do something to like capture it so that you can repeat it. And if you capture and repeat long enough, it creates like a steadiness or like a platform to then go to the next level of depth. And then when you meet the next level of depth in terms of content, it's less overwhelming because there's already some space for it to live. I don't know if I'm making sense, but anyway, <laughs> that's one way to look at it. All right, so looking on page 57, um, under the form is empty, emptiness is form section, there's um, <clears throat> Shariputra likewise. So just kind of get yourself to Shariputra likewise, it's towards the bottom of the page. So Shariputra likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. And so if you want to write a little note next to that section, this is referring to the eight aspects of emptiness, which, you know, is, is something that we don't have time to go into a lot of depth with. The eight aspects of emptiness can roughly be, well, I guess, precisely be divided into the three doors of liberation. Emptiness, signlessness, wishlessness. Yeah, so the eight aspects of emptiness are what are described here in likewise all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic. And if you want to go into that a bit more, you know, Jeffrey Hopkins meditation on emptiness or um, His Holiness's Essence of the Heart Sutra, you know, you can go into some depth with that. But I thought to just go into the rough division of um, emptiness, signlessness. Again, the, three, the three, could you repeat the three uh, aspects? Yeah, uh, emptiness or the emptiness door of liberation, the signless door of liberation, and the wishless door of liberation. So those eight aspects of emptiness can be kind of categorized in those three ways. And so I'll unpack that for you in a moment. Okay, so, the, so basically what we're just talking about, don't get thrown by, by the words, what we're talking about is ways to approach the way things are empty. So first is to look at just the thing itself. The thing itself is empty of inherent existence, just like we always talk about. Um, so all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, meaning no self-existent characteristic. Using the word characteristic is really useful because that's kind of showing us how deceptively, how illusory our life is. We say, you know, what is, I don't know, what is that? Well, here's its characteristics, and we describe its characteristics, don't we? Here's its details, here's its attributes, and that is it. So to say without characteristic immediately gives you a fresh way of accessing emptiness, doesn't it? Let's see, does anything have self-existent characteristics? Yeah, this cup is good, this cup is bad. 
those are its characteristics. It is, you know, it is white, it is blue. Those are its characteristics. None of those characteristics exist in and of themselves. They're not self-creating characteristics. Why? Because they dependently arise. Why? Because they're empty of inherent existence. So good is based on what? This cup reminds me of the cup of my grandmother, the cup of a wonderful cup of tea day, the cup of a country I visited that I thought was beautiful because so-and-so gave it to me. That is what's making it a good cup. Or it's a good cup because it's the size that fits my hand the best. Or it's a good cup because this, a good cup because that. So it's a good cup, no problem. But if I think it's an inherently existent good cup, then if you take my cup, I am sad, right? Hence the problem of life. So if you think they're self-existent characteristics, you suffer when they're contradicted. Right? Simple as that. And, uh, you know, how many um, family deaths and then dispersal of possessions would be so much easier if everyone just remembered that no characteristics exist inherently. Then if someone says, I want grandma's tea set. No, she loved me the best. I should have her tea set. Those arguments would just dissolve because people could just connect to the memory of the person they loved and not need a possession to anchor them to their memory and get fixated on that, right? So it's, it's accessible, it's direct, right? You know, you think, oh, the Heart Sutra is so far out. But to say without characteristic is, is a really a, a lovely invitation for exploration. So this is the door of emptiness related to the thing itself. Then we have the door of signlessness, which is talking about the cause. Yeah, so the door of signlessness or the door of liberation of signlessness is related to the cause of things. So they're unproduced, unceased. Unproduced, unceased. Meaning not inherently produced, they don't inherently cease. So, you know, we could say, take a little seed and then it sprouts. What is the moment that the seed becomes a sprout? When is the exact second you say, now it is transitioned from seed to sprout? You know, can you really point to an exact moment in time or is it more like a scale, whereas one thing decreases, the other increases? You know, inherently existent cause, or inherently existent production, inherently existent cessation, that's not true. What is the internal narrative in our mind? This is the beginning of when I started to be unhappy. Here is the start of when life went wrong. Here is when finally I got my act together and I started to celebrate life again. Here is when, here is when, and we create these like, I don't know, headings or chapters or earmarks in our life and say, this is when it all began or this is when it all finished. And that is not true. Yeah, you just put a frame around it and gave it a label and decided that was true. Yeah, so to say it's signless is to say that it doesn't have inherently existent production and it doesn't have inherently existent cessation not deficient, not fulfilled. This is the, the door of wishlessness. The door of wishlessness is sometimes translated as the door of aimlessness, which is an odd way to put it, or um, oh, what is it also called? There's another one. Oh, it'll come to me. Anyway, so the door of wishlessness is related to the effect. So the prior was related to the cause. This is related to the effect. To, so, to say the effect or to say the result is not inherently existent is to say things are not inherently finished or unfinished, right? They're not deficient. They're not missing anything. They're not fulfilled. They're not complete inherently. Yeah, so, so when you look at the results of things, so when you look at now it's the finishedness or now it's um, the fulfilled, now I have actualized the promise of my life or the promise of my education or the story of this or the story of that, to say now this is the result doesn't exist from its own side. And, and also this is not the result doesn't exist from its own side. But things are neither finished nor are they unfinished. Do you see how that framing can kind of like 
break up the little stuck points in your internal narrative? So three doors of liberation in brief. <laughs> right. can, you, can you say the first one again? What's the name of the first one? Just the door of emptiness. Yeah, the door of emptiness. And then the other two are the, the door of signlessness and the door of wishlessness. So, I mean, these are further subdivided and further subdivided and further subdivided. But just to give you, I think for us at our level of study, I think the three doors of liberation, there's plenty of material to sift through and sit with just within those three, just as long as you know that when you meet more advanced commentaries, there's a more detailed list. Okay, so then we're going to go over to the, the mantra section um, on page 58. So the mantra and then the, the paragraph above the mantra. So um, it says, therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoha, right? Um, it's called the mantra of great knowledge because it eliminates the three poisons. So the mantra of great knowledge means it, el it eliminates the three poisons, anger, attachment, ignorance. The unsurpassed mantra means that there is no greater method to uproot suffering and the causes of suffering than what is described in this mantra, in this sutra. So the unsurpassed mantra means there is no greater method. Then the mantra equal to the unequaled, the unequaled means Buddhahood. So this mantra is equal to it. It leads to it, it shows you it, it reveals it. The mantra equal to the unequaled, meaning it indicates the whole path all the way to enlightenment, not just to nirvana. Okay, and then the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, meaning it pacifies or cuts manifest suffering, suffering that's obvious and present. It also cuts the potential for future suffering, the seeds and imprints. So should be known as truth, since it is not false, meaning it's indicating the ultimate. And um, in the ultimate, there is no disparity between appearance and reality. For us, there is a disparity between appearance and reality. The way things look and the way things are is completely untrue. It's completely illusory. From the perspective of ultimate truth, appearance and reality are accurately together. So that's why it is not false from the perspective of ultimate truth. Okay. So, you know, it seems like it's just saying, this mantra is so great, everybody. Just practice this mantra, it's amazing. But each one of these little sections is actually indicating what the mantra does. Why does the mantra do this? Because it's talking about the five paths, right? I think I've mentioned this before, but the, the mantra indicates the five paths. So the five paths are the developmental stages that lead us to Buddhahood. And so that's, that's the picture, that's the main picture of where we're going. So you don't need anything else besides this mantra or besides this path. Does that make sense? So turn to page 67 and um, the mantra gets unpacked a little bit. Um, and uh, you know, some of you might remember the five paths and some of you not, and that's to be expected. So just to keep us on track on page 67, um, do you see, so all these mantras, the mantra that pacifies all suffering, et cetera, et cetera. Then it says, Tayata om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoha. Everybody there? No? Okay. So um, technically Tayata and Om are kind of little add-ons for the mantra. The main mantra is Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisoha. But you know the framing is important. Tayata in all of our Tayatas means it is thus or it is like this, you know, colon, <laughs> wait for it. Um, Om obviously is the enlightened body, speech, and mind. That's true of every mantra with Om, enlightened body, speech, and mind. Um, so, gate gate would mean literally go, go. 
meaning the path of accumulation than the path of preparation. Yeah, so on the path of accumulation, you're mainly focusing on hearing and contemplating. On the path of preparation, you're starting to bring in meditation, then seeing meditation, meditation all the way through is the main emphasis. So right now we're approaching the path of accumulation. We're approaching having uncontrived renunciation and uncontrived bodhicitta. We're approaching that through our work of hearing and contemplating and meditating. Once we've actually achieved the path of accumulation, we'll continue that process, accumulating merit to realize emptiness, conceptually, and then perceptually, and then repeatedly, and then finished. So then paragate refers to the path of seeing, which basically means go beyond, paragate, go beyond. Then parasamgate, go completely beyond the path of meditation. Then bodhi refers to Buddhahood, to the Buddha. So the path of no more learning. So the whole path of enlightenment is um, in that mantra, the, the five paths are actually kind of tagged and referenced in a lot of places throughout the Heart Sutra. Um, you know, you can, you can read up about that, but um, basically it comes down to like a summary of the whole sutra or the embodiment of the whole sutra is just the mantra itself. Yeah. So any, any questions or comments? about the mantra or any parts about the five paths that you wanted to check in on and clarify? The renunciation is uh, connecting to the accumulation. Uh, yes. yes. So both the foundational vehicle and the Mahayana vehicle need uncontrived renunciation for their paths of accumulation. For the Mahayana path of accumulation, you also need uncontrived bodhicitta. And those two together, uncontrived, is your gateway to the path of accumulation. And so you're accumulating merit, accumulating merit, and then you achieve the path of preparation when you have the realization of emptiness conceptually, intellectually. You have the union of calm abiding and special insight directed on that emptiness. It's still conceptual. You repeat it enough, it becomes perceptual. Once it's perceptual, it's the path of seeing. Yeah, you remember? Yeah. And the path of seeing goes in kind of two stages when you're in meditation and then subsequent attainment. And soon after, then you have the path of meditation, which is repeating that and repeating that along with 10 grounds of a bodhisattva. Right, a bodhisattva is 10 levels, 10 grounds, 10 bumis. These are all synonyms. Yeah. The first seven being the impure, then eight, nine, and 10 being the pure. Um, the first seven clearing afflictive obscurations, the last clearing obscurations to omniscience. Um, the first section, you're getting rid of intellectually acquired, then you're getting rid of innate. You know, that whole conversation we've had before, but just kind of click right, that's what's happening on the five paths. And once you finish the path of meditation, you achieve the path of no more learning, complete Buddhahood, where finally appearance and reality are simultaneous, when you can perceive relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously. Um, up until that point, only ultimate truth appears when you're in meditative equipoise. 
Yeah. Yeah, are there any bits of that you wanted to review or clarify? So I just wanted to um, bring your attention to a really nice meditation um, related to the perfection of wisdom, which is on page 52. And it's, um, it's related to the ultimate truth verses of 37 practices. And it's the commentary by Pema Chodron. It's a, a new Pema Chodron book, which is called Welcoming the Unwelcome. A wholehearted living in a broken-hearted world. So she has a very nice description of practicing open awareness, which can kind of move you in the right direction with these practices. But it's um, it's a bit less intellectual. It's a bit what would you say experience near? I don't know if I'm using the word right. But anyway, it's it's a it's a lovely meditation. So um, just have a look on page 52 when you feel like it. It's a very short section. Um, but if you're just kind of wanting some more meditation material that's going in this direction, I really recommend that section. All right, so we'll just go ahead and dedicate. Tayata gate gate para gate para sam gate Bodhi Soha Tayata Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhi Soha Tayata Gate Gate Para gate, para sam gate, bodhi soham. Okay, see you next week. Mm. Bye, Yosan. Thank you.